Ladies and gentlemen, my dear guests, I would like to welcome all of you most warmly. It's fantastic that you took your time to come to Berlin to the Jewish Museum to participate in this event, but I would also like to welcome everyone who is viewing us. We have a live stream, and I would also like to wish all of our live stream guests a warm welcome. We would like to award the Human Dignity Award, uh, which is being donated by Roland Berger. This year, this is already happening for the seventh time. What is so good about it is that it is not only showing an honor and appreciation, this is also about money, because with money, you can make a difference. And uh, this is something which is happening, and, and it deserves a mention as well. So some of you might wonder, some of you who might not have been informed beforehand, who exactly is going to get the award? What are the criteria? The answer is straightforward. This award goes to persons and organizations who are engaging for respecting, promoting, and uh, developing human dignity and uh, um, what exactly does this mean? What is human dignity? If we look at our basic law, Article 1, human dignity is inviolable. But what does this actually mean? Does it mean that everybody can determine for himself or herself what he is, who he is, where he or she lives, and who he or she loves? And can those persons expect that this is respected? And I can imagine that most of you, some nodded or Already would agree to this. But still, this um, precious thing that is human dignity is um, disrespected every hour, every day, every second. And this not only when we look beyond our borders, it also happens over here in Germany without the state protecting its citizens or without the citizens intervening themselves. And I believe that this is already saying it all. We have the impression that especially xenophobia, hatred, hate speech, racism, that all of this is on the rise and pervasive. And this is why it is so important that we are awarding prizes like this, because we are honoring people who are not just simply giving in. No, they are standing up and they say, no, this is not going to happen with us, not with our neighbors, not with anyone who is suffering, not with somebody who does not have the possibility to defend themselves. And this is why I would like to most warmly welcome the current and the former prize winners, because they do what we ought to do every day as civil society. And this is why they deserve our respect and our appreciation. Of course, there is the nice statement of Caroline Imke, who is an author, and she said human rights are without any strings attached. They don't have to be earned. And unfortunately, I have to add, but they have to be defended and protected. And this is what you do. And this is also what many other people do who are not necessarily celebrated here today on stage. But we should also think of them in this moment. But we would also like to thank Karen and Roland Berger, because they have initiated this award. And they see to it that the limelight, the spotlight is shed onto these organizations organizations and the people that run them. And they do give them the attention they deserve and also a very generous award of money. Therefore, Mr. Bagger, I would like to ask you up here on stage to join me, even though I know that some of you I did not welcome according to the rules of the protocol, but I believe that you will do this now and make good for me. So Roland Berger, a welcome to you. President of the German Bundesrat, Minister President Dreyer, Lay Excellencies, Ambassadors, Ladies and Gentlemen, Members of the Parliaments of the Länder and the 
Bundestag, members of the Board of Trustees of the Roland Berger Foundation, distinguished award winners and former award winners who still are award winners of the Roland Berger Foundation, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy that I can welcome you here to the Jewish Museum for awarding the Roland Berger Award for Human Dignity. And I'm especially thanking you, President of the Bundesrat, Minister President Dreyer. Thank you for giving a laudatory speech to this year's award winners and for personally giving them the Human Dignity Award 2017. I would also like to thank our Ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador Professor Brown. Thank you also for announcing the names of the award winners later on during the event. And together with Minister President Dreyer and myself, you will also bestow the prizes. And last but not least, I would also like to thank Professor Schaefer. He is the director of the Jewish Museum. It is an honor and a delight to us to be in this wonderful glass courtyard once again. Ladies and gentlemen, we just heard it. Human dignity is inviolable. We need to respect it and protect it. And this is not only the obligation of all governmental power, as it is enshrined in our constitution, but according to my deepest conviction, it is also the obligation of each and every one of us and of civil society at large. And this is why the Roland Berger Foundation is trying to very specifically promote and encourage human dignity in three different ways. For one, through conferring this Human Dignity Award to people who have been active on the ground by also taking personal risks to their own lives and limb, and that are committed to human dignity under difficult circumstances, as we will find out later. Secondly, by enabling talented and committed children and young people to access education and through this to access a self-determined life in dignity. And we do this by promoting these children from their first year in elementary school up to the end of secondary school so that they can then go to university. More than 700 scholarship holders are served by the Roland Berger Foundation throughout Germany at the moment, and more than 250 have already passed their A-levels and are now at university with excellent results. Last year, 54 scholarship holders have passed their A-levels with 1.6 as an average, and normally 2.4 is the German average when it comes to grades. And some of our scholarship holders who are all very committed are here in this room. And their mentors, who are voluntary mentors, are here as well. We should never forget them when we talk about the success of our scholarship program. I would like to most cordially welcome you all, and I would like to wish you all the best for your future. And thirdly, we are also supporting minor unaccompanied refugees. Amongst the total number of refugees that have been welcomed in our country, these are the group of refugees that are most vulnerable. So we give these children a new home, including accommodation and everything that's part of this. We also try to impart what is most important for them, that is the German language, in order to access our country, as well as the values of our society, education, personal personal development as well as a vocational perspective. And it's good to be able to say today that a large share of those young people that we support have already successfully started a vocational training program in some companies. Ladies and gentlemen, 
in the Verfassung verankerten Verpflichtung, we have the obligation which is enshrined in our constitution to respect and protect human dignity. We can only live up to this obligation if we distribute opportunities fairly, especially over here in Germany. Because also with us in Germany, there are many areas where we still don't see fair opportunities. It is still the case that children whose parents hold a university degree are six times as likely to qualify for university and to study at university as compared to children where this is not the case. And one young person in five in Germany is left behind and does not even reach the lowest competence level in the most recent PISA study. Or putting it differently, he is functionally ill illiterate or she is functionally illiterate. This is 20% of the young people in our country, in no other industrialized country, and this is unchanged. And it's a bit of an embarrassing finding of nearly all educational studies that have been carried out internationally that socioeconomic backgrounds uh, do determine the school outcome on educational opportunities of a child as much as they do in Germany. And this is what we have to change. Therefore, our scholarship program is doing this together with all ministries of education and culture in the 16 federal states that are in charge of this, the lender. So let me just add in parentheses, our social security system is also trying to do a lot in order to help elderly people that are in disadvantaged situations, but we do too little where injustice starts, that is with young people whose um, equitable access to education is most important for our future. Human dignity, dignity, ladies and gentlemen, of course includes women's dignity. In the developed world, for decades, equal opportunities for women is being fought for and we have, without a doubt, already reached many areas of progress. But in many parts of the world, women don't have the same rights as men have. They are massively disadvantaged when it comes to their position in society, their protection in everyday life and their dignity. And even more, violence against women and contempt for female dignity are pervasive in many countries of this world. Genital mutilation, forced marriage, child labor, and child marriage are just a couple of examples of human rights violations that hundreds of millions of women and children still have to suffer from in the year 2017. But fortunately, there are people and organizations who are courageous, who are continuous, and who are very successful in fighting these and other fundamental violations of human rights and human dignity, especially for women and children. Three of them are going to be honored by us tonight with the Holland Berger Human Dignity Award. And I'm very delighted to be able to introduce these exceptional people to you and be able to honor them. Our awards committee had to choose from 200 potential candidates, and all of them would have merited the award, and the committee chose those three. And I would like to welcome most warmly Dr. Fortwingler, who is from the awards committee, and she is honoring us with her presence at the ceremony. A warm welcome to you, Maria. Ladies, gentlemen, in a couple of minutes you will get to know our award winners, but let me just add a very important comment on our award. This award is not only an honor. It does not only come with a project award money that the award winners will use for their future work. This also comes with support and assistance that we give to the award winners as a foundation when it comes to pursuing their freely chosen activities and messages. 
in the field of human rights work. It is very important, and this is why it is so important that you, President of the Bundesrat Dreyer, and many other politicians, that you praise these award winners, that you give a speech in honor to them, and this then really reinforces the significance of the award. Most of these organizations don't necessarily have the support of their own governments in their home countries. So when they return with our award, and the experience tells us about this, you will hear about this in a minute then it's a little bit easier for them. Then, for some time at least, they are taken seriously by their own government. And this is so important. Some of our former award winners have also traveled to Berlin tonight. The lawyer, Radja Nasrawi, from Tunisia, who is committed to fighting torture, but she is also an active lawyer who is representing victims of torture and is helping them obtain justice. The human rights lawyer, Marzen Darvish from Syria, and three representatives of our Congolese award-winning organization, Petite Flamme, Mr. Bess, Ms. Müller, and Ms. Wolf. A warm welcome to you, and good to have you here with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this was my welcoming speech and my remarks for introduction. I would like to wish you an inspiring evening, and I would like to thank you all for your support that you're already showing by being here with us. So thank you very much for this. Thank you ever so much, Mr. Berger. I knew that I could rely on you. You mentioned all the names of uh, everybody here, so thank you for making good what I omitted. And also, I would like to thank you, the couple, Karin and Roland Berger. Thank you ever so much for organizing this event tonight, because I think you described it very well, why this day is so important today. Not only that politicians are communicating this out in the world, but also everybody else who can be an influencer. Before we look at the current award winners, let us also look back, because this award is a sustainable one, and we are also interested in finding out what happened, not only with the award winners and their organizations, but also what happened with the money. The money, if you don't know this, is Project Tide, and it is also dispersed over a couple of years. So you don't get this as a one-off amount, but you get this bit by by bit, and there are good reasons for this. You just mentioned this in the countries where these organizations work. Sometimes the situation is not ever so easy, and you cannot always expect that the country they are working in will always support them. This is why we would like to take a look back, two years back, and here we see the award winners, Al Ganesh Fezaha, and then we go to North Africa, we go to a refugee camp in northern Ethiopia, and the human rights activists for more than 550 refugees um, became active. She freed them from the hands of people smugglers and more than 1,300 from prisons in Sinai. And with the award money, she also erected buildings made of stone and wood and uh, all of this um, with corrugated steel roofs, and we also have uh, refugee children who get a warm meal. This was uh, one of the award winners. This brings us to Petite Flamme. They were just mentioned by Mr. Becker. This was a school project originally in the Congo, but with the award money of the Roland Berger, a Roland Berger scholarship was created. Two pupils that have left successfully Petite Flamme school, they can go to university, and in the meantime, we've already had four scholarship holders. They receive writing utensils, transport costs are covered, and there's also 
also money that is set aside for imponderabilities. And the main attention is schooling bitterly poor children. And some of the representatives of the organization are here today with us. And they are certainly happy to talk about their projects with you. And the third award winner is Catherine Camilleri from Malta. She used the money in order to create an integration program for family members of refugees that join their family. So there are language classes, uh, job interview training programs, and so on. And she knows that the award money she received here two years ago is finite. And this is why she hired a fundraising expert, but her main attention is still dedicated to her campaigning for refugees that she's representing and defending. So it's good that she's a lawyer. She knows exactly what she's doing. And this brings us to an award winner from 2011. I do not know who was here back then and who has a déjà vu, sort of. If you are here and were there back then, you might remember that there was one empty seat. And there was an unfortunate background to this, and we will certainly discuss this very quickly. This had to do with the fact that the absence, the empty chair, was not voluntary. But I'm very happy that the guest we could not see back then, we can welcome today. For one and a half years, he has been in Germany now, Mazen Davish. Mazen Davish, so that this seat does not remain empty, I would like to ask you to come here on stage with me. And I'll just quickly grab the mic. The microphone is here. Wonderful. Yes. Oh, I can speak in English. Up to you. I can speak in, I can speak in English. Arabic, Spanish, <laughs> dog language. No problem. I would like to tell the audience, first of all, why you got this award um, six years ago, okay? So I will do this in German and then we switch. Mazen Davish from Damascus is courageously fighting for human rights, especially for the freedom of the press and expression in Syria. He is demonstrating, he is publicizing, he is informing foreign media about the events in Syria, and he is one of the very few credible sources of information. He's highly appreciated for his work and his commitment, but he had to pay bitterly for this. For three and a half years, he was imprisoned in different prisons in Syria, and he has had to endure very bad torture. It's all the better to have you here today. So, first of all, how are you today? Thank you. I'm fine, especially because I have a lot of friends here in Germany, so I'm fine. To and do my best. How was it possible for you to escape and to leave your, your home country after all these years? <coughs> Usually, until 2012, I'm the person who can't leave Syria. I spent the last 12 years have travel banned. So suddenly, I find myself outside and can go back, so it's a little bit complicated for me, but uh, there have some... Uh, I'm lucky because I'm still alive. A lot of my friends, a lot of Syrian human rights fighters and journalists killed uh, through the torture because of the war, so I feel thankful that I'm lucky to still alive. But how did you manage to come to Germany? How was this possible? This is possible because a lot of friends uh, who uh, helped me in support uh, the program Daniel Stiftung, Mr. Brown, Mary and uh, Michael uh, Naumann. A lot of uh, friends here, uh, they support me to be safe and to come to Germany. And they helped you also after you 
uh, came to Germany, so you had some helping hands, especially someone over there. Yeah, for sure. My new family in Germany, my river work was here. Michael Norman, and uh, also Dr. Tobias, who's uh, the first person I meet them at the airport when I directly arrived and they are the journalists. They host me with my wife here and their house until we find our apartment and start our life here. By winning this award, you also received um, some money. What have you done with the prize money? Uh, actually, my uh, colleague in the center, they refused to use uh, the money between 2011 and uh, until 2016, until I be released. And uh, we start working at two levels. First one, uh, as I mentioned in my speech for Skype in 2011, that I will use this money in uh, accountability and uh, uh, transitional justice. In Syria at that time. So now we start uh, this wonderful uh, part of our work uh, here with the Federal Institute uh, in uh, Germany. Uh, we were the first uh, uh, case against the military uh, uh, the military security service uh, in uh, Syria and now even we are very happy that uh, the court accepted the case and we start uh, even hearing the judge start hearing the witness. So this is uh, one as example we collect evidence. We are very happy that we have even more than 600,000 documents and evidence uh, about the war crime in Syria and uh, establish also another case in France. And uh, now we are there two cases uh, next month. Uh, we will have a press conference here in Berlin. Also, uh, one case against the uh, Air Force uh, Security Service. And this is also this case with the uh, cooperation of the uh, uh, European Center for Constitutional and the Human Rights here in Berlin. And so, also, I uh, be happy to say thank you uh, for all the effort and support. The other part of our work uh, is regarding the fighting the extremism in Syria and the hate speech, uh, the violent speech. So we establish also cooperation with UNESCO uh, Observatory and to monitoring the hating and uh, the violence uh, towards speech in uh, the Syrian media, especially the human media and the social media. One of, part of our commitment to fight uh, extremism, ISIS, and this right kind of uh, thought and mentality, and hope that also the point we will achieve some result in this field. And you're still working here also as a journalist? <laughs> Actually, this is one of the bad things that I'm very busy in this good life. So. Still, of course, I uh, write the uh, article and the uh, work as journalist, but not like before, but I'm totally journalist. One step after another. So, um, let's talk about Syria, because you just mentioned ISIS or um, there are other groups. Um, for us in Germany, especially for the audience, it's quite difficult to, to understand who is good and who is bad. Can you? Yes, for sure. Actually, one of the problems as a Syrian citizen, we, we find it that it seems like you have the fascist regime and the fascist Islamic movement. This is part from the story and uh, from the proof, but this is not the whole picture. Still in Syria, I think the majority of the Syrian who believe in the human rights and democratic value and all sharing the same, even value, liberal, dignity, human rights, uh, those the majority of Syria. But uh, unfortunately, they are the weakness party. You know, the regime have his uh, supporter, and they have his tools, and uh, equipment, and uh, also the Islamic terrorist movement have their supporter, have tools, media. 
But uh, the democratic movement, which has between both sides, uh, 2011 when we arrested, it's not by... Uh, it's something systematic that 15 of us arrested from the regime and four from other uh, uh, colleagues arrested from uh, Islamic uh, rapper group, which still up to now kidnapping uh, Razan Zaytouni, our uh, lawyer and uh, friend. So the democratic movement, the civil society, those people who believe in dignity and the human right, sit in the middle between two fascist power and attack from both sides. Who would you support then? A huge number, all who believe in, in, in dignity, in human rights, who sharing the same value, support us. But you know, in the war, the, the, the voice of women, it seemed like bigger or uh, uh, showing more than the voice of mind. But in the end, I believe, when this war will stop, that we will see that the Syrian society can rebuild and reconciliate the situation mm -hmm. and give a very good example about human rights and dignity. We are fighting 50 years from dictatorship and 1,000 years from uh, terrorist thought. So it's not easy. This is what I learned even from here, from Germany, from the 30-year war, from the first war, second war, that to reach this level from democratic and from dignity for the citizen or for the whole country, it costs a lot. It's not easy, not a gift. So we should keep fighting for it. Last question. You are also a participant of the Syrian talks in Geneva. Do you think there will be any solution soon or should we have a bit more patience? Unfortunately, what happened in Syria now is not a Syrian conflict. It's a proxy war. It's a regional and international war. So it's not uh, even, I don't think they will ask us as a Syrian if we want to stop the war or not. But in the end, the, the most important in the war that in one day it's finished. I don't believe that there is a war continuing forever. This is perhaps the only good thing in the war that it's be able to finish. We should also push to, to, uh, through this uh, political negotiation to find a solution it's now, I don't think that there is any party can win in Syria. All of us lose, the, the whole Syrian now lose. So it's not about winner, it's about peace, how we can reach peace and achieve a suitable political agreement. Also, we don't want just to sign a paper and then suddenly we find that there is a new round of the war. So we need a sustainable peace, mm -hmm. so it should be built in transitional justice, not to gift the uh, warlord, to gift the Syrian ordinary citizen mm -hmm. and people. Nevertheless, better sooner than later. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. And Thank all you. the best. Elif Shukran. Well, he just said it. At the time, we had a Skype connection and we had an empty chair. This year, unfortunately, we have another Skype connection. Not to Syria, who was not allowed to come here, but actually to Egypt. Because though a person who got an award in 2011 is not allowed to come to Berlin. However, before we talk with him, I'd like to introduce him to you once again and tell you what he was awarded for. 
The Arabic Network for Human Rights Information, with its founder and director, Gamal Aid, received the award for the long-term fight and success to improve freedom of opinion, belief and expression to strengthen democracy and respect of human rights in Egypt. And how the country has changed can be seen by the fact that in 2011, six years ago, he was able to come to Berlin. Now, in 2017, he's only one of many who is not allowed to leave the country. But now we have the opportunity, and I hope that it works out with Skype, to have a little conversation with him. Gamalait. Fantastic. So here's your applause, first of all. Do you hear me? Can you tell us a little bit about your situation right now? Uh, actually, I'm at my office right now, uh, working, banned from traveling. They assist my uh, account ban, close, shut down the whole libraries. But I guess I'm in better situation than many Egyptian, many journalists. We have 58 journalists in prison. Uh, it's part of my, our role to support them, to protect them, to give them legal aid, to, to tell the Egyptian people inside Egypt and outside, we have a dictatorship. We have to fight for democracy. We paid the price for democracy. We have a right to bring out human dignity, dem democracy, equal equality, and justice. And if I had to choose between begin loved by the government or by the people, I will always choose the people. I don't care what they can do for me, for our organization, uh, but I'm always optimistic, uh, enjoy, my, enjoy my life. Uh, I have a feeling like 2011 with uh, Egyptian people, Huge number of people uh, trust us, and more and more people volunteer, trying to support our work, to work with, our, with us. And if I compare between our situation and the regime's uh, situation, I guess we're in the better situation than them. So, uh, continue work. Happy for my colleague Mazin Darwish is out of prison uh, right now, and I hope soon I will soon uh, my lovely city Berlin. Gamal, obviously you are a very optimistic person. <laughs> is this also the reason? Always. Why you are not leaving your country like a lot of other people did already? Actually, I remember when I was in Berlin uh, during the last ceremony. I was in when I was in Berlin. They they were banned many people from traveling. I was outside, but I get I, I left actually. I I used to live in New York when I used to work with Human Rights Watch. I left to be between my my people to build the democracy. So uh, it doesn't ma matter they ban me from traveling or not. Uh, my position is here in Cairo to fight against the dictator uh, dictatorship and to build our uh, future, not only for me, but for the new generation, for the kids, for, uh, for a student, for the future, yes. I hope you can hear your applause. So how dangerous is it Enjoy to... Enjoy <laughs> How dangerous 
is it to speak up that honestly right now? Okay, um, let me tell you, there is two police officers from state security force uh, spying my account, my account on Twitter, on Facebook. I guess they are spying now my my talk, but I we have a, a, a right for freedom of speech. We have a right to express our opinion. We have a right to say enough your dictatorship Enough violates the human rights. Enough to distribute the, the justice. This is not crime. What they are doing, it's crime. And continue corruption, continue repression. So it's part of the, our fight, our struggle to speak up against, against the dictatorship. And we will do that. So you're trying to support children in slums by opening free libraries, so-called dignity libraries. Is this still possible? Uh, actually, there were six public libraries in poor neighborhood, but, but part of the revenge of the regime, this is regime, uh, to revenge, to like make a pressure on me to um, shoot my uh, my mouse. They close the whole libraries. So, CC built 17 prison since he came in July 2013, and we built six libraries. Now they shut down the whole libraries. We give service and we benefit. The benefit of the libraries more than 200. 60,000 children, kids, students uh, in poor neighborhood. They close it uh, and shut down the whole libraries. Uh, so I guess it's part of the dirty, uh, dirty uh, revenge. But uh, I'm, as I said, I'm still here, optimistic, will fight, will reopen the li public library. Right now, I started to open two offices to support, and uh, as a lawyer, journalist, student, and media uh, media producer, and the internet user in Egypt, the only space for fighting right now, the internet. So many cases, we are going to support them, to train them how to speak up for democracy and for justice. It's our country, all of us, not their country. It's for people. I'm proud of 25th of revolution, proud of the new generation, and part of, again, part of our role to support them, to push them to, to go forward. You have spoken with Angela Merkel about all these things, especially about your libraries. What was her response? Uh, um, let me tell you the truth. Uh, I met her, I know. Government is not civil society, is not independent media. I just try to tell her, if you cannot support democracy, please don't support the dictators. If this is your friend of the, the government, his enemy of democracy. And he, this is kind of example what he, what he did, did he, what he did. She talked about, uh, she knows about uh, the, how important the freedom of speech, and she understood how important our, our role, I told her, okay, do your best, at least to support Egyptian people. Not, we are not part of the deal, trade, trade deal. And uh, that's it. Yeah. Kamal Eid. 
Thank you for your honesty and you are an obviously and very inspiring man. So take care of yourself, but don't stop your fight. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, as a journalist, male and female, despite all the difficult things that happen here, we are in a very comfortable situation. And we journalists, we really know to appreciate this, not only since Denis Yücel is in prison in Turkey. And uh, for a long time, we have been trying to communicate with journalists in Turkey. We try to help. Nevertheless, we are humble. We have to be humble and have to say, thanks God, we are here and live in Germany where we can still enjoy freedom of the press. And we are also supported by state authorities. So, we have looked back twice. And uh, this was looking back on the year 2011 where three people were respected for their work. They were pioneers also for the Arab Spring. And the third in the group, and Ronan Berger mentioned her already, is also here, the Tunisian lawyer Radia Nasrai. She came on short notice, wonderful that you made it possible. And uh, I guess later on you're also with us and probably provide some answers to the question what you do right now and what keeps you busy. Wonderful to have you here. This year the focus is not on the what we call Arab Spring, but on a completely different topic. And uh, now we start with the ceremonial part of this evening. And it's not just me who wants to do this, but I would kindly ask Harald Braun to come on stage. And before you will do your job, what you're allowed to do and we're asked to do, I have another question, Mr. Braun. So far, you're the permanent representative of Germany with the United Nations. That's true. Is that fun? And how much fun is it? Well, the United Nations, as most organizations in the world, comes with pros and cons. Of course, it's very positive that we work for human rights. And of course, it's also difficult when we think about supporting refugees, taking care of refugees. Of course, it's good that the United Nations can take care of topics and people in the world that are otherwise forgotten. And uh, to work to this aim is fantastic. However, if we have a look at the Security Council and see uh, that it's not really running smoothly, it doesn't really make me happy. Thank you for this honest answer. Ladies and gentlemen, after this uh, very impressive look back to get to know the award winners of the past, we should now turn to the present again. It's now about the Roland Berger Human Dignity Award 2017. And Mr. Berger said at the very beginning that the foundation has a so-called award selection committee. This committee is independent, independent from the Board of Trustees, and uh, I have the honor to be part of the Board of Trustees. And this Independent Selection Committee has decided this year to hand over the Roland Berger Human Dignity Award to three different groups. First, the women's rights activist and chair of the Catania Women's Development Association, which was also founded by her, to Anne-Marie Cocker from Sierra Leone. Second, to the NGO Talent Search and Empowerment from Tanzania, run by Mr. Alfred Tipenderana and his supporters Eric Morrow and Paul Buchendahl. And third, 
The German-Iraqi Association Wadi, chaired by Thomas von der Ostensacken and his colleagues Jiman Rashid, Abdullah Sabir and Anne Mollenhauer. Congratulations, Ms. Korka. Congratulations, representatives from Talent Search and Empowerment. And congratulations, dear representatives from Wadi. We are very thankful with you to your courageous, pioneering and relentless work. Ladies and gentlemen, the Roland Berger Foundation has uh, actually visited the award winners during the past few year, weeks in Sierra Leone, Tanzania and Iraq, and uh, a movie was produced to present their work and their environment. And I do now really hope that technology is with us and uh, we start our portrait in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, a desperately poor country. Decades of civil war and the latest Ebola epidemic have left their mark. People like access to clean water, hospitals and schools. But above all, there is a centuries-old tradition, cruel and inhumane, that marks the fate of the people to this day. Female genital mutilation. 94% of all the girls have been circumcised. That's more than other country in the world. FGM is a problem in this nation because it affects the health and well-being of women and girls. It affects their development, health and their education. Anne-Marie Korka has made it her life's work to explain the truth to as many girls as possible. Deeply committed to this cause, she speaks at a school far away from the capital city. The school holidays are about to begin, traditionally the time when the most female circumcisions take place. Anne-Marie Korka tells the girls her own painful story. She was circumcised at the age of six, enslaved by rebels and raped. She fell pregnant, but the child died shortly after birth. Today, Anne-Marie Cocker is accompanied by Diaka. She's one of the few girls who was not circumcised. Diaka tells the audience that this was one of the most important decisions of her life and that Anne-Marie Cocker is helping not only her, but every girl who makes the same decision. FGM is internationally outlawed and punished as a brutal human rights violation. In Sierra Leone, however, there is no law against the practice. Anne-Marie Cocker founded two women's rights organizations back in the 1990s and now works with partners across the country. Her approach is to talk to everybody involved, even those who carry out the circumcisions. Two of them are sitting around the table with her today. Sierra Leone has about 50,000 women working as female circumcisers. They enjoy a high status in society, and it's also a lucrative business too. Families pay up to $200 for each daughter. Female circumcision has nothing to do with religion, explains Diaka. It is practiced by Christians and Muslims equally. Uncircumcised girls are considered impure and are not acknowledged as grown women until they have been through the ceremony. Anne-Marie Korka lives in a slum in the capital Free Town, along with about 50 orphan children whom she and her husband look after with the help of several assistants. She has also founded a school. Today, Anne-Marie Cocker is in a particularly underdeveloped region in the east of the country, teaching women how they can make an income for themselves. The women are growing cassava. Many of the women on the course have not been circumcised and have been thrown out of their villages as a result. One cap of cassava flour earns them the equivalent of four cents at the local market. That's enough to live on. I 
Auntie Anne is a mom at the end of the day. She's my mom. Auntie Anne is a mother at the end of the day. Yeah, that's how I see her as a woman who did not only help us apart from FGM, apart from protecting us from issues like this, she was there for us. My dream of this nation, Sierra Leone, is to see an FGM-free Sierra Leone. And I want to see women being educated, even to the least community, the least village. Tanzania. The former German colony in East Africa is ten times bigger than Sierra Leone and is also a much more developed country. But the young population suffers from lack of a future. Instead of going to school, they spend their childhood on the streets. The number of street kids in the port city of Dar es Salaam alone is estimated at 800,000. But Eric is not one of them. He has an hour and a half walk ahead of him when he leaves his house in the morning in the slum on the outskirts of the city. He meets Farida on the way. Farida! Both of them are heading to the same place, to the NGO Talent Search and Empowerment, or, as they call it for short, TSE. We focus on empowering the kids. We're not giving money at TSC. We're giving skills. Because we know giving skills is one of the most valuable things when you give education to a child. Since 2008, Talent Search and Empowerment has been supporting destitute children and young people between the ages of 9 and 25 years. Most of them are orphans or come from families who are unable to afford the cost of school fees. TSE gives them a free education. They offer computer classes, English lessons and a small sewing room. The many activities available under Talent Search and Empowerment's creativity program are also very popular. Most of them take place outdoors. At TSE, we offer many different courses. We teach dance, acting, music, singing. I see it as my role as a teacher to develop the young people's creativity, uncover their talents and help them put their ideas into practice. I believe that youth can change the world. That's why I'm here. These youths have long since changed their own world. Rather than falling into a downward spiral of poverty and criminality at street kids, they are putting their talents to good use. Eric, for example, is now a professional xylophone and keyboard player. Frank, another boy from TSE, earns his own money with his juggling skills. And Farida regularly goes on tour with well-known Tanzanian music groups. Thanks to talent search and empowerment, the youths have become shining examples for an entire young generation.
Iraq, a land scarred by war, terrorism and violence. The autonomous region of Kurdistan in the north of the country was making promising progress until recently. But then the attack on the Yazidi religious minority in August 2014 saw the return of terror to the region. Brutal human rights violations are daily fair. Terrorists from so-called Islamic State are committing genocide before the global public's very eyes. He came back, tied me up and raped me. I tried to bite him. I cut my veins with a piece of glass, but the cut wasn't deep enough. He said, no, you're worth nothing. I'm going to sell you. Marwa spent three months in Raqqa, the IS stronghold in northern Syria. She was repeatedly sold onto different men for $10 a time. Then she managed to flee across the border back to northern Iraq. We set up mobile teams to drive around the refugee camps looking for these girls, finding out how we can help them on the ground, what their needs are, what they require, who can we put them in contact with, do they need medical support, that kind of thing. And what came out of that was the Jinda Center. We picked up girls from the different refugee camps and drive them there every day for two or three weeks. They spend the day there and they can take hairdressing courses, craft classes, do painting and singing. Over the last three years, Vadi has looked after more than 600 Yazidi girls. The name of the center, Jinda, is Kurdish and means rebirth. For the deeply traumatized girls, the hours they spend in the protected space is nothing less than that. Many of the Vadi helpers are themselves Yazidis, like Sarah, who is looking after Marva. She keeps in touch with most of the girls for years. Supporting SED women is an important project for Yad Vadi, but it's by no means the only one. We never believed that humanitarian aid solves problem. On the contrary, our idea was always about specifically getting involved in areas that are very important for social change. In the 25 years since it was founded, the German Iraqi charity has already brought about a great deal of change. Vadi campaigns helped get the death penalty for women abolished in Kurdistan. Vadi brought it to the world's attention that female genital mutilation is not only taking place in Africa but in the Middle East too. Vadi has been involved in the drafting of numerous laws, including child protection laws. And Vadi wants to do still more for the Yazidi women. The she has just recently opened a greenhouse. There, women can learn how to cultivate crops. That's another step towards returning to their lives. Another step towards a future of autonomy and hope. Wow, in one short praise, impressive. And now I'm very happy that the state premier from Rheinland Panathinaid is with us, Malu Dreyer. Ms. Dreyer, I have one question to you before we look out into the world, because Mr. Berger just addressed it before. In Germany as well, there are children and young people who are left behind, certainly to a completely different extent, but one young person in five is left behind when it comes to an educational career. So what do you do as a federal state as well in order to change this? It's, of course, an unacceptable state of affairs. I can just agree with Professor Berger. And in our land, in our federal state, we have a program which is called Nobody Without a Degree. And we were very successful throughout the past years so that we want to make sure that nobody drops out of school. We still have two or three percent where we could not be successful, but we are ambitious so that we can achieve this in the years to come. No school should, sorry, no child should leave a school without a certificate. So at the moment, you're the president of the Bundesrat, so I think there is a lot you can do. You have the floor. 
Good evening, Professor Berger, Mrs. Berger, Excellencies, gentlemen, ladies, but especially distinguished award winners of this year's Human Dignity Award of Roland Berger Foundation. Sometimes it is breathtaking, no matter how often you deal with this personally. This is what happens to me when I hear again that an estimated number of 200 million girls and women worldwide have to live with genital mutilation. The letters FGM, they are just an abstract acronym for what the intervention actually means for the life of a girl or a woman. The unimaginable, cruel, cruel destruction of the most intimate place of her body, the most violent violation of her integrity, the most extreme brutal, taking away of uh, self-determined, fulfilling sexuality. So this right to sexual self-determination is denied globally to several hundred million women with the rationale that only if they are circumcised, they are pure. Only that way they are desirable for a man. Only that way they could become a valuable part of society. Many girls do not survive this intervention. And the women who have uh, to suffer the consequences very often suffer tormenting pain. Sometimes they suffer life-threatening complications when they become pregnant or give birth. And the emotional suffering is something those who are not affected can hardly assess. Ladies and gentlemen, female genital mutilation exists in more than 30 countries of Africa, but this severe human rights violation, as we heard, is not only pervasive in Africa, not only in the Middle East or Southeast Asia, also in the European Union. According to estimates of the EU Parliament, around 500,000 women and girls are at risk of FGM and 180,000 girls girls and women. In Germany, we have an estimated number of 50,000 victims, and their number is increasing because there are more and more that migrate from countries where this practice is far spread. So over here, 1,500 to 5,700 girls are threatened. Most of them come from Eritrea, Indonesia, Somalia, Egypt, and Ethiopia. FGM is violating the human rights to physical integrity, and it's also violating elementary and fundamental rights of the child according to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So we have to do everything possible in order to globally outlaw FGM, to legally ban it, and to actively fight it. The Worldwide Day of Genital Autonomy is going to happen in a couple of days on the 7th of May, and it is asking us to do this. The Roland Berger Human Dignity Award 2017 is also shedding light on this cruel injustice, and this is how it makes a contribution to overcoming it. In the practice of um, female genital mutilation, and in order to put an end to it, we need an effective ban, and we also need a fundamental cultural step change, because only if the deeply rooted conviction is given up that this intervention is making a girl a true woman, only then girls will be fully protected. For that, we need education. And as many studies demonstrate, we need rooms for discussion where all parties can be involved in an open and trusting exchange on FGM. And it requires structures that empowers that empower girls and women so that they can defend themselves against violence and lead an autonomous, self-determined life. The Human Dignity Award of the Roland Berger Foundation this year is honoring three projects that we just saw in the film, and they are precisely pursuing these two approaches, fostering the rights of the child and empowering children and young people through education, and both elements are connected in an exemplary way. Ms. Corker. 
It is with deep respect that I look at the story of your life and your courageous action for the rights and dignity of children in Sierra Leone, which is still one of the poorest countries in this world. Neither the loss of your mother nor the experience of forced circumcision neither the vulnerability after the death of your grandmother nor male violence or the death of your child could make you give up. Instead, with unparalleled energy, as we could just witness, you created the Freetown School, a place that gives a perspective to girls girls that escape from circumcision and that have paid for this with being ostracized from their family. Your house has become a home for orphans, also of orphans from mothers that died because of circumcision when giving birth. As we just heard in the film, we can look at the faces of these attentive, thoughtful and anxious girls uh, that listen to your co-workers and they report about their life without circumcision. And this tells us what your life's work is all about, to protect the dignity of each and every young woman and protect them from this barbarian intervention. For many years, with wisdom and energy, you are fighting against the cultural roots that make female circumcision a socially required practice. You fight for an effective legal ban in Sierra Leone as well. And at the same time, you are fighting for concrete opportunities so that girls can build their own livelihoods. For your aims, you are looking for partners and allies throughout the country, also amongst the circumcisers, as we could see in the film. This is why you created the National Movement for Emancipation and Progress. This is where politically you counteract genital mutilation, child labor, and forced marriages. This is why you founded the Cantania Women's Development Association that is liberating women from prostitution and is giving them the opportunity of training programs. Ms. Corker. Your dream of Sierra Leone without genital mutilation and access to education for all women to the very last village has to be an obligation to us to support you. So I would like to thank you with the greatest respect and with all my heart. Opening up opportunities is also the focus of talent search and empowerment from Tanzania. Breaking the vicious circle of poverty, lack of education and crime. And this in Dar es Salaam. This is what you, Mr. Tibenderana, Mr. Moru and Mr. Bukendal, were coming together for 10 years ago. And as we could see looking at the young people in the film, you are very successful in this. However urgent and grand the challenges of your NGO are is something that can be exemplified by two numbers. Nearly one third of all people and 29% of all children between five and 14 years are forced to work as children. And for disadvantaged youth, especially those that are seeking their fortune in the streets of the biggest city of the country, you are trying to offer through talent search and empowerment a contact point and provide them with the diverse services like the education center, computer school, football club, cultural initiative and creativity workshop. And through this you are creating preconditions so that these children and young people have perspectives for a life beyond poverty and crime. Part of this is education and protection from drugs, HIV, prostitution and unwanted pregnancies. Of the young people that come to see you, 
many for the first time in their lives maybe do experience that they are appreciated with their individual dignity. Because with you, they are not only learning English or sewing or how to handle the computer, dance or music, they also learn self-confidence. They learn that they can do something, that they have the opportunity to achieve something, that their past and their background is not determining their future. This is empowerment at its best. Because talent search and empowerment is imparting valuable knowledge and skills and also the confidence to make the best of it, it is sustainably improving the conditions of these disadvantaged youth. TSE is changing their world, or even better, as the young teacher just said it in the film with shining eyes, these young people themselves are changing their world, and through this they become shining examples of a very young generation in Tanzania. Ladies and gentlemen, there are lots of discussions over here with us, what it means to fight the causes of migration. You, Mr. Tibandarana, Mr. Bukandal, and Mr. Moro have set an example through TSE, and you demonstrated how this can actually work through giving young people conditions that don't give them a reason to migrate, but open up future perspectives. They acquire skills, and with them, they can then start a self-determined life. With greatest gratitude and respect, I would like to congratulate you personally and Talent Search and Empowerment on the Human Dignity Award of Roland Berger 2017. Congratulations. The third award winner of tonight has for 25 years been showing in northern Iraq what is possible if confidence is built consistently. With your organization, Vardi, you, Mr. von der Ostensacken, and Mr. Zabia, as well as Mrs. Rashid and Mrs. Mollenhauer, as a German-Iraqi initiative since the 1990s, you have accomplished something extraordinary in northern Iraq. You are also creating places where especially girls and women can develop concrete opportunities. In the province Salamania, you have created kindergartens and schools, you have seen to it that more than 5,000 girls and women learn how to read and write. You have successfully carried out campaigns against forced marriage and honor killings, and you have founded women's centers where women can have an exchange of views in safe spaces. They learn how to tailor, how to do hairdressing, but they also get legal counseling, as we could see in the film. In 2011, you accomplished something extraordinary in the very closed and patriarchal society of Kurdistan. In the film, it was just addressed. For the first time, you could also raise awareness of the widespread practice of FGM in that region, and you could bring about a ban. With the promotion of FGM-free villages, you've also demonstrated that with smart approaches, you can effectively push back this practice which is neglecting the dignity of women and humans. Other organizations come and go, Vardi stays. This is what you said, Mr. Von der Ostensacken. Just when you were asked what the reason for the success of your Iraqi German corporation was, and you described it, it was your staying power. And this was something that I could relate to specifically. For 35 years in our partnership between Rhineland Palatinate and Rwanda, we experience how much projects that are located on the ground can make a long-term difference in the lives of people. Such a grassroots partnership is not only important for the so-called developing and emerging countries. This also is important when it comes to our responsibility as Germans and Europeans, responsibility for the global and political developments worldwide. This is impressively confirmed by the current focus of Vardi, your commitment to the cause of young Yazidi women who could escape from IS captivity. The fate of the Yazidi women enslaved by the Islamic State 
became known to the public in Germany because of the successful welcoming of a larger group of them in Baden-Württemberg. Wadi itself is um, assisting on the ground. It has mobile teams and northern Iraqi refugee camps, and it is looking after the medical and psychological treatment of the girls and women that have survived IS terror. Your Jinder Center that we saw in the film, it is located in the northern Iraqi city of Dohuk. And this is an oasis for the women that have gone through unimaginable suffering. They can recover there before they take their first steps into a different and self-determined life full of hope. We just saw Vadi will continue to support these women, and for this it also requires our support. Mr. von der Osten Sacken, Mr. Sabia, Mrs. Rashid, Mrs. Mollenhauer, the perseverant, diverse, targeted commitment of Vadi for more than 25 years now is deserving our greatest gratitude and highest esteem. And I would like to voice both, and I would like to congratulate you with all my heart and personally for receiving the Human Dignity Award of Orland Berger tonight. Professor Berger, your foundation is bestowing this award for the seventh time this year. You would like other organizations worldwide to see the commitment of the award winners as role models, and you would especially like to sustainably improve the living conditions of women and children in the countries. We just heard that this prize is not only a nice recognition for a day. By supporting such exemplary civil society initiatives of the award winners, it is making a difference to the lives of people. And through this, it is making human dignity much more of a reality. The work of Mrs. Corker of Talent Search and Empowerment and of Vardi has deeply touched and impressed me. And I would like to wish you that the Human Dignity Award by the Rollenberger Foundation is going to encourage you in your commitment and is motivating others to follow your example. So I would like to thank you most warmly for being able to honor the commitment of these wonderful award winners. Thank you very much for your attention. Minister President, thank you very much for the honorary speech, and I would like to ask you to stay up here. Let me ask Professor Bagger and Ambassador Brown to join me here, because I think it's high time now. Please do come here, because we would now like to also honor the award winners, and I would like to ask them all now to come up here together on stage, and this is your applause. So, you can now hand the certificate to Anne-Mary Corker.
Das ist für Sie. This is for you. Ganz genau für Talent Search and Empowerment. This is for Talent Search and Empowerment. Yes, exactly. Take care. And Ambassador Brown, I would like to ask you to present the certificate to the third organization, Vadi. So, keine Sorge. So, don't you worry. So, jetzt gehe ich kurz dazwischen. so let me just briefly interrupt you because the closing photo will be taken at the very end. First of all, we would like to give the floor to the award winners. And this is why I would like to ask the ambassador, Professor Berger and the minister president to leave the stage because this will still take a couple of minutes. Wonderful. I would say you can start. Go to the mic. And the floor is yours. Dr. Roland Berger for the congregation here or the audience and all the award team. I, Madam Anne-Marie, founder of Katanya Women's Development Association, National Movement for Emancipation and Progress, a coalition working to end FGM, and Royal King's International Elementary and Secondary School, and partners across the country. Want to heartily thank and appreciate Dr. Roland Baja for his initiative to found the Roland Baja Human Dignity Foundation to recognize and pay tribute to individuals around the world who have dedicated themselves to opposing human rights violations. I want to thank you and your team and the entire people living here in Germany. My dream and vision has always been to see women and girls live free from violence and how to achieve this goal have ever been my big question and concerns. I have been in activism since 1996, over 20 years now. I can change these harmful cultural practices, female genital mutilation or cutting, child marriage, and all forms of violence against women and girls in Sierra Leone. Violence against women and girls, especially sexual and domestic violence, is prevalence in Sierra Leone. According to the reports of Sierra Leone and CIF in 2014, 45, over 45.5% 45 of women aged 15 to 19 had experienced physical violence, including torture, child labor. Women and girls are in disadvantaged position in our communities, which restricts or limits their education. Most times, girls take more responsibilities in the household duties, like fetching water and engage in livelihood activities at the cost of their education, like street trading and others. This is why, in my community, I am trying very hard to make sure and work with others to end this kind of violence against women. The Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone had a severe social and economic impact 
on women and children, especially girls, which led to an increase in sexual violence, leading to a high rate of teenage pregnancy, which we are also working on. Girls, especially those who had lost their, their relatives to Ebola, we are having to engage in transitional sex to cover their basic daily needs. According to UNFPA report, shows that 18,119 teenage girls got pregnant during the Ebola, which is huge. I have passion in investing in women empowerment and in girls' education, as evidence shows that investing to empower women and in girls' education has considerable health, social, and economic benefits. One of my testimony is the love and passion I first show to my family members, like educating them. You can see examples of them. Afterwards, I also have passion for entire womanhood in Sierra Leone. She is one of the examples. She is living in the South, and we work variously. Various strategies, laws, national strategy for a reduction of teenage pregnancy, Child Rights Act, Sexual Offense Act, have been established, but there is still high violation of adolescent girls. Do these policies and laws that exist actually protect girls in reality as the rights of children is not respected as it should in my country? Kauda, Namep, Awea, women. Chance, girls' empowerment, that the girl that you saw in the screen Diaka, she was to be with us, but because of family problem, can you imagine she is responsible to take care of her mother and the other members of family as young as she is? So that prevents her from coming here. And working with all these people reduce the rate of violence against women, girls such as sexual violence, female genital mutilation, child marriage, child labor, and know their rights. We provide education and economic empowerment, livelihood programs for women. Then loan scheme programs and girls with the little contribution we get from many people here, many organizations and many friends in Germany have been supporting our work and also through the members' contributions. Vulnerable women and girls receive formal and informal training from us that serve and inspire individual advancement. Like we have the vocational institute, we do tailoring, yard dressing, and even we, start, we have started a computer program with three computers, all computers, just to help the women to do their communications. I normally say I am a world changer. My dream has come true. I will no longer bow down my head and I will stand upright, lift up my head together with the partners who will give us support to see that women and girls have rights and we are and are valued in our community. I want to especially thank my partner, Reverend Charles, who also is always using his pulpits in the church to address the issue of women. And he's also supporting those 50 children that we have. He used his tithes money. He used his salary in the church to address the issue of these children. In fact, the community called him a man of God for women. I want to thank Auntie Musu that is standing here. She's also doing a wonderful in the South, wonderful work, because I cannot do it alone. We do also other programs like education and social empowerment for women and girls, case management of gender-based violence, agriculture and food security, skills, livelihoods, and social entrepreneurship. 
I want to thank you. And my last word is, I want you to know that women are very valuable. They go with the children. You cannot deal with children without really uh, talking about women. And I have certain words that are used for women. I say women are gates. They are means of you no know, road to pass. They are channel. They are ways. They are doors. First, from birth. Without women, all of us that are here today, we should not have been here. But through that door of a woman, that makes whatever development, whatever we have, we have it because of that, those doors we are open, those doors we are given. They allowed everybody to be where we are today because from birth, they have been the door. So I want to thank everybody for this award ceremony. The world, I want us to value women. Women, there will be no development in any country without the contribution or the participation of women. And that is why our countries are backward, because the women's issues are backward. We need to bring them forward. Thank you very much for listening. Finally, I want to actually present some of our work. So the foundation, this is done by girls, young ladies. So we want this to be at your office. The Human Dignity Award Acceptance Speech, 4th May 2017. We bring you special greetings from the people of Tanzania. Frankly speaking, we are humbled, honored to be given this special award tonight in Berlin. We are humbled, honored, and at the same time, excited to be in your midst to receive the Human Dignity Award. Our deepest thanks go to the Roland Breger Foundation and to those who nominated and selected our fellow awardees and talent search and empowerment. As we do so, we wish to recognize the presence of Honorable Professor Roland Berger, the founder of Roland Berger Foundation, the president of the German Bundesrat, Ms. Dreyer, the permanent representative of Germany to the United Nations, Ambassador Brown, members of the executive board of Roland Berger Foundation, the members of the nomination and selection committee and other distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, we share this award with all those who have been our mentors, advisors, partners, and friends in this journey. We share this award with the generous donors and the volunteers from Germany who have always been giving so kindly of their time, talents, and resources. We share this award with the children and the young people we serve, who inspire us about the future and make us care about our legacy. We share this award with dedicated partners such as Kawaida and Albert Unleben. We share this award with our exceptional staff members who have always been rendering their services to the orphans and the vulnerable youth diligently and with great commitment. We sincerely 
thank the Rhode Island Burger Foundation and the Selection Committee for honoring talent search and empowerment with this precious award. Believe us, ladies and gentlemen, it is a very proud recipient that is standing here before you. Ladies and gentlemen, our acceptance and the receipt of the Human Dignity Award would not be complete without letting you walk with us along memory lane to see where TSC, that is Science Search Empowerment, is coming from and to pay tri tribute to the gallant men and women who have made this milestone a reality. Talent Search and Empowerment is a non-governmental organization which is independent, voluntary, non-religious, non-profit making, non-political entity, and autonomous. Talent Search and Empowerment was officially registered on 11th day of April 2008 in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Talent Search and Empowerment is uniquely positioned to enable the youth Orphans and the other vulnerable groups be guaranteed of equal access to valuable resources and opportunities by imparting them with valuable skills and knowledge. It is, it is beyond doubt youth are a dynamic force and an important segment of any society. The youth are in constant search of an challenged identity and a dignified place in today's society. As such, there is a compelling need for promoting human development and dignity amongst the youth and the vulnerable children. The empowerment of youth is vital to undertake the challenging tasks in economic and social development. The bright future of our nations depends on the extent to which the youth are prepared and equipped in every aspect to face social, economic, and political challenges. Talent search and empowerment is proud of the following remarkable achievements. Talent search and empowerment is a homely home for orphans and disadvantaged youth. A number of girls and boys have successfully managed to acquire knowledge and skills that have helped them secure employment or become entrepreneurs. Talent search and empowerment has varieties of programs such as tailoring, sports, music, computer, traditional dance, hip hop, creative dance, language, and so many others. And this being the case, therefore, the youth have a wide range of choice. More than 100 girls and boys have been enrolled by Italian Search and Empowerment, and they are guaranteed of getting quality education that gives them new hope for the bright future. The youth get education on HIV and the reproductive health. The youth and teachers Came, to, came twice to Germany for theater shows in the various cities under the umbrella of Dar es Salaam and the Hambu Partnership. Talent Search and Empowerment has actively been involved by various human rights activists in the campaign to fight against the abuse of children and women in Tanzania. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today we face the following challenges. The purchase of a plot and the construction of a TSC center because TSC is using a rented building. The lack of funds for the establishment of income generating projects such as a music band and a recording studio. Teachers' salaries and the retention. The lack of enough teaching and learning facilities to cater for the number of youth that highly need our service. Some girls do not realize fully their dream because they are forced to get married by parents or guardians 
in, the, in order to get dowry in the form of cash or kind. Most families are victims of abject poverty. And this being the case, some parents or guardians force their children who are saved by talent search and empowerment to look for cheap labor instead of proceeding being imparted with quality knowledge and skills for the bright future. It is, it is beyond reasonable doubt that there are big challenges and it could be overwhelming if we let them, but we will not let them. We are determined to face them and win through for the bright future of the youth we serve and the sustainable development of talent search and empowerment. It is our great conviction that Lauren Bragg Foundation will never let TSC, that is talent search and empowerment, walk alone. Talent search and empowerment has indeed a true, has indeed found a true and reliable partner in its endeavor to cherish human dignity and the fight for the rights of orphans and vulnerable youth. The award that has been given today to TSE by Roland Berger Foundation has made readers and teachers of science research and empowerment feel rejuvenated and ready to save the orphans and the disadvantaged youth it, with one heart and one spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, before ending our Human Dignity Award acceptance speech, we find it rather indispensable to present to you the quotable quotes of Nelson Mandela on human dignity as follows. No power on this earth can destroy the thirst for human dignity. Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity. It is an act of justice. It is the protection of, of a fundamental human right, the right to dignity and a decent life. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of the others that will determine the significance of the life we read. Let me repeat this, the last quote. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what it is what a difference we have made to the lives of the others that will determine the significance of the life we read. God bless Roland Berger Foundation. God bless Time Search and Empowerment. God bless all of you. Together we can do more. Thank you very much. Aziz Said Birgal, Aizel Hadur, Liebe Anwesende, Dear Guests, my name is Shiman Razid Rawaziz from Kurdistan, Iraq, and I work with the organization Wadi, and I do so since 2000. And with me is Madula Sabia, and uh, he also works in this organization since 1999. Thomas von der Ostensacken, the representative of the German organization, we'd like to thank him very much because for 25 years now he has been committed to Wadi in Iraq. It is great joy for me to stand here and be with you here in Berlin tonight and to speak to you. 
Actually, I am very optimistic, not only because there are so many special people in the audience, but also because of the numerous people I have the honor to represent tonight. So tell me, how can I represent the voice of thousands of women in the area where I come from, the female Yazidis who fled from the terror of ES, or the girls and the young women who so far have not been registered, who had to undergo female genital mutilation. Only thanks to the organization Wadi and its partners, thanks to the cooperation, it's possible now for me to be here also with you to the partnership of parliament in the country, because in 2011, we agreed on a new law to ban domestic violence and also a law to ban FGM, actually a quite unique law in the Middle East. Several thousand women over years have contributed by participating in the program. Numerous NGOs on the ground made a contribution too. And of course, we also represent all of them tonight. Wadi, for more than two decades, has been cooperating and joining forces with people and not been working for people. And I mean this quite literally. We have an agenda. And with you to our agenda, I can tell you that it's about finding sustainable solution. And this is only possible if it's supported by the people who are affected. And therefore, Wadi is not just a management board or director or someone who benefits here and there. No, Wadi is many, many people who work and live in the different projects on different locations. This award that we accept as Vadi is actually an honor to all of us. And I am so grateful that you have picked us as one of the organizations to achieve this award this year. This encourages all of us to keep going, and it's highly relevant for us. Also because it shows that it's not just us. We are not alone. No, it means so much to us. See, we work with families. They have lost sons and daughters in the war. They suffered poisonous attacks, not just under the government and rule of Saddam Hussein. No. And again and again, we were also told that they were not listened to sufficiently. Today, we work with Sassidi girls and women who got hijacked raped by Islamist extremists, terrorists. Now they have the chance to live a better life, something they deserve, and they also deserve the attention of humanity at large. Now they get so much attention from so many people, then this will continue to encourage them. And we thank you so much for your attention and for the fact that you don't close your eyes to us. Gender, a center, and this means rebirth, got reopened by us. And this is to give those people a new life who lost their previous life because of terrorism. Actually, we'd also like to thank Mr. Braun very much. Uh, he is present tonight here in the Jewish Museum. And we also like to thank the whole audience. Actually, I just gave a very short speech tonight. And this is also because we don't want to steal too much from your time. I think the images are very impressive. We have a website, a website where you can get further impression of what we do. So therefore, thank you. understood me you should go to the center that everyone can see you so jetzt dürfen sie noch mal applaudieren and now everybody you're allowed to applaud
Yeah, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, das war Ladies ja and also Gentlemen, so this was it. The Roland Berger Foundation Human Dignity Award Ceremony. And I think we really have chosen appropriate award winners. We look forward to the next award presentation in two years from now. We wish you all the best. Make good use of the money you have received. So continue to support the people on the ground. But I guess this is something I don't even have to tell you because this is deeply rooted in your heart. At this point, thank you so much for your attention here in the room, also to all those who were following via the live stream. Technology does not allow them yet to beam them to the reception afterwards because we have prepared some food and snacks. And of course, it's also about having good conversations. Enjoy this, have a good time, and if you want to, feel free and chat a little bit with the award winners. And maybe, well, you also feel like supporting them on different occasions. And of course, also the previous award winners, which we should mention right now also. So once again, enjoy the evening. All the best and thank you.